Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us. My name is Mary Lee Watts. I am the Director of Federal Affairs at the American Society for Microbiology, and I will be your moderator today. And now it is my pleasure to turn it over to Dr. Robin Patel, President of the American Society for Microbiology, for opening remarks and to introduce our speakers today. Thank you for joining us today for COVID-19 testing, vaccines, and therapeutics. We have two world-class scientists presenting to you today who I will introduce in a moment. The American Society for Microbiology, or AFM, is committed to bringing you the best science available so you can better understand the current pandemic and make evidence-based policy decisions. We can also provide insight into broader issues within the microbial sciences. Members of the American Society for Microbiology have been on the front lines in the fight against COVID-19. Back in March, ASM convened a virtual summit of international experts in the microbial sciences to set research priorities on diagnostics, vaccines, and therapies for COVID-19. Our speakers today were active participants in that summit. We know that much is riding on the development of a SARS-CoV-2 vaccine. As you will hear from our speakers, today's work on a SARS-CoV-2 vaccine builds on decades of basic research into pathogens and how the immune system responds to infection. Thanks to increased federal investments in basic, translational, and clinical research and programs like CDC's Advanced Molecular Detection Technology, we're in a position to move faster than ever to develop a new vaccine. And now, it's my pleasure to introduce our speakers for today. Dr. Paul Dupre is the director of the Center for Vaccine Research, Jonas Salk Endowed Chair for Vaccine Research, and Professor of Microbiology and Genetics at the University of Pittsburgh. A distinguished molecular virologist and vaccine designer, Dr. Dupre facilitates and conducts studies focused on the development of diagnostics, therapeutics, and vaccines for infectious diseases that pose risks to global public health and security. He directs Pitt's Regional Biocontainment Laboratory, a high-security facility embedded in the Center for Vaccine Research that allows scientists to safely contain and examine potentially dangerous pathogens. He's an expert in measles and mumps viruses and studies barriers that stop viruses jumping from animals to humans. Dr. Dupre and his laboratory have been working on the development of a COVID-19 vaccine. Dr. Stacy Schultz-Cherry is a professor in the Department of Infectious Diseases at St. Jude Children's Research Hospital and the Deputy Director of the WHO Collaborating Center for Studies on the Ecology of Influenza in Animals and Birds. Initially trained in cellular biochemistry and mechanisms of wound repair, Dr. Schultz-Cherry pursued a career in virology. Her research interests include influenza and enteric virus pathogenesis particularly in high-risk populations. She's recently conducted groundbreaking research into the effects of obesity on flu infection and vaccine response. Through her work at the WHO Collaborating Center, Dr. Schultz-Cherry is involved in worldwide influenza virus surveillance and participates in the biannual vaccine strain selection meeting with a specific focus on viruses with pandemic potential. She also co-directs an NIAID-funded Collaborative Influenza Vaccine Innovation Center with Dr. Ted Ross at the University of Georgia. The objective of the center is to improve influenza vaccines, especially for high-risk populations. I will now turn it over to Dr. Supre and Schultz Cherry. Thank you very much. Uh, so we're here to talk about the pursuit of a vaccine for SARS coronavirus 2. That a virus which causes the disease COVID-19. And I am here in the Center for Vaccine Research uh, in Pittsburgh. Uh, this is just an image of uh, Pittsburgh. Of course, you know Pittsburgh uh, through our rivers, uh, the Ohio River, just on the extreme left-hand side there. Uh, Pittsburgh has tremendous history in vaccines. In fact, whenever you think about Pittsburgh and vaccines, uh, 65 years ago, just last month, uh, the Salk vaccine was announced as global news for an emerging infectious disease 
way back when uh, the polio virus, uh, which was really a scourge uh, of this country and many, many countries in the world uh, all those many years ago. So this is where Salk uh, developed that vaccine in Pittsburgh. And uh, that really was a shot that echoed around the world. Salk was incredibly influential in developing a, a vaccine. And that really has trickled through uh, the University of Pittsburgh for many, many years. And that's the genesis of the Center for Vaccine Research, which we have uh, here at the moment. So we're going to talk about vaccines a little bit about the history of vaccines, a little bit about the success of vaccines. Vaccines really are a tremendous intervention. Uh, here we have the rates uh, in the pre-vaccine era. Uh, this is the rate for measles virus. You can see 99% reduction in cases of measles virus um, <clears throat> in, in the United States by the use of this highly efficacious vaccine. Here's another example of pertussis. Again, significant reduction in the rates uh, of infection due to the use of these highly efficacious vaccines. And then back to polio. Polio vaccine has put that virus to the edge of eradication. And it's really only present in a number of, a very small number of countries in the rest of the world. So what uh, we need to remember is vaccines work. Uh, the black and white images of Pittsburgh are not the uh, current pictures. Here's our Center for Vaccine Research, uh, where the studies that we conduct are carried out right in the middle of the uh, medical campus. And uh, this is a slide I've used for many, many years. Uh, one of the focuses of our center is emerging infectious diseases. And these are all emerging or re-emerging infectious diseases. I've colored just one in. Uh, up until the start of this year, there was a big gap where COVID-19 is present. And of course, you're here to hear a little bit about the COVID-19 vaccines. What we know is that viruses emerge, viruses continue to emerge from animal reservoirs uh, in the world. And whenever a virus emerges, a new virus, uh, we've talked about biocontainment facilities. This is where we need to do these types of studies in biocontainment level three. And this is just an example of a person who's working in that containment uh, facility where we culture the virus, we grow it in cells, we grow it in tissues, and we need to develop animal models to study that disease. Uh, on the left-hand side, you see a very nice photomicrograph of the SARS coronavirus in green infecting the cells. It's really important to have academic science where people are creatively developing new interventions and also linking to industrial science because vaccines are not uh, really anything more than candidates until a vaccine uh, becomes a product. And of course, vaccines as products are required millions and millions of doses. So there is a strong connection in vaccinology between academic science and industrial science. I'm not going to cover phase one, two, and three of the vaccine development uh, process. Uh, Dr. Shields Cherry will bring you through those parts. I'm really going to focus on this introductory section on the laboratory studies that we have to conduct in these biocontainment laboratories. Uh, these are the pre licensure uh, types of studies that uh, we conduct. Then we'll talk a little bit in the second part of the talk about. Uh, the phase one, two, and three studies. What's really important to remember is antibodies neutralize infections. Here's a cartoon in green of a virus, and the blue are the antibodies. And antibodies are super important uh, for vaccines. Uh, and many, many vaccines uh, generate antibodies which neutralize the infection. And what's really important whenever we're thinking about the vaccines I'm going to bring you through is this spike protein, this sticky out blob on the outside of the cartoon of the coronavirus that you see in this image. And really, at the moment, uh, the majority of the world is focusing on developing uh, antibodies which recognize that spike protein. And the antibodies then, we hope, will neutralize the infection. And that's really how the, the vaccines work. We trick the body into thinking that it's met SARS coronavirus by 
presenting it with inactivated or attenuated forms of that spike protein or, or, or that, that virus. And then we prime the immune system ready to meet the real virus uh, in the real uh, wide world. So the spike is really very important uh, in terms of vaccine development. So uh, if it's all about the spike at the moment, what are the different ways in which vaccines can be generated? Well, we we'll start at the right hand side and we look at antibodies. This is what we're trying to make. And we know that the antibodies recognize the shape of this spike protein. So we can either introduce the protein, or if we take one step back, we can introduce the genetic sequence, the RNA, which generates the protein, or we can take one step back further and we can introduce the DNA, which makes the RNA, which makes the protein, which is recognized by the human immune system, which then generates uh, the antibodies. So that's the basic premise of what we're trying to do. So I want to bring you through five different uh, um, situations. This is an example of a DNA vaccine where the spike protein, and this is being conducted by Novio Pharmaceuticals, the spike protein is being introduced into people. That DNA makes RNA and the RNA makes protein and the protein is recognized in those individuals. And this is one of the candidate vaccines that is moving through the pipeline. These are very different ways to produce vaccines compared to the way salt generated it all those years ago and, and Sabin as well for the poliovirus vaccine. Uh, really, this is a rational, rapid vaccine development because this is a disease which we didn't know until very recently. And we want to develop these vaccines rather quickly using the most up-to-date uh, approaches that we have. So DNA vaccines are being piloted. Secondly, RNA vaccines are being piloted, and the names that you will have heard of uh, will be Pfizer and Moderna. Uh, these are in uh, early clinical trials already, and rather than directly injecting DNA and making RNA from the DNA, in this instance, the RNA is uh, injected into the, into the person. The RNA will then be turned into the proteins, and remember, the proteins will be recognized making antibodies in the vaccine uh, vaccinees, and those antibodies, we hope, will then go on to neutralize the virus infection, the SARS coronavirus 2 infection. So a second way to make vaccines rationally, rapidly in the middle of this pandemic. The next approach is approach using a virus, another virus actually called adenovirus. And this has been piloted by AstraZeneca, people in Oxford using this chimp adenovirus, this little vial that we see here. And also that's been worked at by Janssen, uh, one of the, the companies of the Johnson & Johnson group. Uh, they don't use the chimp adenovirus, they use adenovirus 26. This adenovirus has the genetic material which encodes the SARS uh, spike protein. And whenever this adenovirus is injected into the vaccine candidates, as we've seen, as you may have heard in the media, antibodies which react against that uh, spike protein are generated. So again, another developmental novel way to rapidly, rationally develop vaccines against SARS uh, coronavirus uh, 2. The final uh, one that I want to introduce you to is, is a recombinant virus. And this is the recombinant virus, which you see this little bullet shaped thing in the middle. That's being worked on by IAVI and Merck. And rather than just having the, D on the DNA on the inside, this recombinant replication competent virus is a vesicular stomatitis virus, DSV. And it actually expresses the spike proteins on the outside of the virus, so it really does look on the outside like SARS coronavirus 2, but on the inside, of course, it's a vaccine candidate. It will not cause that disease. And like the other products, candidate vaccines, they will be injected into people and we will determine whether or not those people mount an immune response and whether or not they make antibodies which recognize the SARS coronavirus 2. So 
of whistle stop tour to the modern ways in which we develop vaccines. This is just an example from our work. Uh, we see the SARS coronavirus spike here in green. You see the nuclei of the cells in blue. And then you sell, see the cell supports the structure of the cell in red. And what we know here is we can take a vaccine, a measles vaccine in this, inter, in, in this case, and we can express, we can produce the SARS protein on the outside of measles as well. So this is another one of these replication competent uh, viral vectors which can be rationally and rapidly generated. So a whistle-stop tour to see how we uh, are approaching the development of vaccines. Uh, this is a piece that I contributed to in The Guardian. It was uh, a really a pleasure to talk to the reporter and uh, we, we really discussed about these rational, rapid ways to generate viruses. And I used this term, salt, to never really have dreamed of the multitude of ways in which we can develop new vaccines in this new era, this renaissance of vaccinology uh, that this pandemic has driven us to. And of course, vaccines are really important. Uh, we know that it's not a vaccine, as I've said already, until it's a product. It's not enough just to make these vaccine candidates in the laboratory and test it in small numbers of people, in small numbers of animals. There are hundreds of millions, there are billions of people in the world, and each of those individuals is equally important and equally in need of a vaccine for this disease. So whenever we think about vaccines, we need to think about the challenges of making not just one or two vaccines, but millions and millions of doses of that vaccine product. And that's the laboratory studies, the approaches that are being used to develop these recombinant vaccines. And now I hand it over to my colleague and friend, Dr. Stacey Schultz-Cherry, who will bring you through the next phases of vaccine development. Thank you, Dr. Dupre, for a wonderful introduction. And my job now is to walk you through after we have these fantastic vaccine candidates, how do we actually go from the laboratory or the bench to the bedside? Well, what you'll see is that the vaccine process is actually a long and sort of winding road. It really starts, and so these are estimates with the research phases that you just heard about. It's, you know, identifying, identifying what you need to make a vaccine to, whether it be a virus or a bacteria, and then what's your target on that virus? As Paul mentioned, with SARS-CoV-2, it's really the spike, but that's something that we will have to continue to test. With influenza, which is my area of expertise, historically we always thought it was the hemagglutinin, but now we know that there are other and perhaps even better um, vaccine candidate targets. So you identify this antigen, and then you have to find a way to express it or produce. Then the next step is really testing it in preclinical animal models. And finding the right model is difficult, and it depends on your uh, virus of interest. For SARS-CoV-2, mice perhaps are not the best model, as they are for many of the other um, viruses and bacteria, but hamsters and ferrets appear to be good animal models. And what you're looking for is a model that will um, give you an immune response and mimic disease similar to people. The next step, before you can even get this into your human, is the manufacturing of that vaccine candidate. And that is also a long process. And here's an example of really how complex this manufacturing process is. First step is when you have that candidate, how are you going to express it? Is it going to be in cells, insect or mammalian, in bacteria, is it RNA or DNA, or are you going to produce it in eggs? You have to find a way to manufacture large quantities of it. You then have to harvest and purify. And if it is a virus, a bacteria, uh, some kind of potentially infectious component, you have to inactivate it. And then the work actually begins to start assembling this vaccine, formulating it, filling the tubes, 
freeze drying, packaging, batch releasing, and transporting. Very complex process that you have to consider some of the downstream complications, including the stability of that product. If you send it to doctor's offices, public health care clinics, is it going to have to be stored in the refrigerator? Is it going to be stable? How long will it be stable for? All of these are incredibly important considerations when you're manufacturing any kind of product, including a vaccine. All right, so you've got your target. You've manufactured it, and you can see now we're getting into these longer timelines. The next step is to test this in humans. And the main, main thing we look for in a vaccine is that it is safe. 100% safe is my, there we go. Sorry, did not turn my camera on. All right, so let's talk about the phases of a clinical trial. And again, the main um, thing we're looking for is safety. So you start with really dosing and toxicity studies in preclinical animal models, in cells, before you move into people. And the first phase, or phase one, done with a small number of people to really evaluate the safety of that product, gather information about how the drug interacts with the body. If a candidate passes phase one safety, you move into the, the phase two, which again, more safety, larger numbers of people, you now look at dosing. How much of that agent is required to have a good immune response and the right immune response? Is it effective, and do you have side effects? The next a phase three study is much larger. This is where you're going to confirm effectiveness and monitor safety. And at that point, if a product has moved through all three of these phase three uh, trials, it can apply for FDA approval before it moves to phase four, which includes post-marketing safety and efficacy. So one thing to remember is Vaccine trials are performed in healthy adults, right? You're talking about typically people that are anywhere from 18 to 50 or 60 year olds with no underlying complications. And this can be um, problematic if your target population for that vaccine are perhaps not healthy adults. Maybe your high risk groups, including the elderly, pregnant women or infants, or people with underlying complications or comorbidities, things like asthma or obesity or diabetes in the case of SARS-CoV-2. And this is where these phase four studies become important in that you may now start testing in these higher risk populations. But again, this is why it takes so long and why Every time we make a new vaccine and you change the platform, you go from an insect cell to a human cell, you go from an RNA to a DNA, you have to repeat a lot of these processes to make sure it's safe. How much do these sorts of studies cost? Well, this is an estimate to go from the research phase to full licensing. You can see it is quite a long and expensive endeavor, even if it's sort of a well-oiled machine. For example, the influenza vaccines. We know that there is a lot of interest and a lot of work towards making more effective influenza vaccines, um, potentially universal vaccines. But the, the vaccines that we currently have have really been in place since the 1970s, and they follow the same process. And the process is, throughout the year, there's influenza surveillance around the world. And this is overseen by collaborating centers and the World Health Organization. And this data on these viruses that are circulating throughout the world, the genetic information is collected. And a small group gets together twice a year, February for the Northern Hemisphere, September for the Southern Hemisphere, to review all of the data. What are the genetics of those viruses circulating look like? If you have antibodies to a vaccine form of 
the virus, will it protect you from the circulating viruses? And there's a week-long meeting that decisions are made by these uh, experts from around the world. And what they will do is um, suggest viruses that should be part of the next year's vaccine. Once that decision is made and announced, then companies begin working towards making seed stocks of these viruses. You then have to grow them in eggs. You have to harvest and purify them. You have to make standard um, reagents. Obviously, you have to check um, purity and stability, go through the manufacturing process. You have to do this clinical trial to, to check safety and efficacy and then you have your vaccine. And that's why they take anywhere from five to nine months. You know, in terms of influenza vaccines, if your very first step, you identify a virus or strain that you want to include in your vaccine, but it doesn't grow well in eggs, you're going to have a difficult time uh, producing a vaccine to that strain of virus. So if you look at this whole process, there's room for improvement. Let's start from the beginning, identifying your antigens and producing these antigens. Historically, as Dr. Dupre mentioned, you have to have that agent. You have to have the virus. You have to have the bacteria. That is no longer true. We can actually use the genetic information of these viruses to create synthetic vaccines. So we no longer need to have the virus. And this was invaluable during the 2009 pandemic influenza um, outbreak when we were able to create a vaccine um, in less than a year, not just create it, but have it distributed, have it in people. Still too long, but our, our ability to create fast vaccines is increasing. And again, part of this is having that genetic information, be able to use that rather than having to have the live agent. The next step are these animal models. We don't know which of these best mimic humans. So perhaps what many people have suggested and what groups um, throughout the European Union, UK are looking towards are using things like cells from human lungs or nasal or um, immune cells to actually have organs on a chip where you can test some of the effects of these potential vaccine candidates in human cells. They're also doing human challenge studies. And this is where you have a very well-defined and characterized virus that causes very little disease that you recruit people and bring them in and actually challenge them with the virus that you are trying to protect them from with the vaccine. This is gaining more and more acceptance in many places around the world. And you can see where being able to actually test that vaccine candidate against the virus or the bacteria that you're trying to protect it from would be incredibly powerful. The next are there processes that we could use to actually improve, increase um, the flexibility of the, and even the stability of products and the manufacturing process itself. You can use computational and mathematical models um, in open access um, cloud-based platforms to actually look at things like, can we improve the manufacturing process so it is more flexible? So if there is a manufacturer that's currently making influenza vaccines and eggs, can they quickly change to doing an RNA vaccine. Currently, that is not so easy, and that's something that would improve the process and allow for faster, potentially more effective, and even less expensive vaccines. You can always use, also use this to look at stability, but it's beyond that. We can use these computational mathematical models to really work with the, the immunologist to start asking things about, can we predict what would be the best vaccine platform? What on that virus or bacteria would be the best target? And what is the immune response that we're trying to elicit in a safe and effective vaccine? 
So if we go back to this and the knowledge that, that the vaccine process is, is expensive, what we need to start thinking about is really um, investing in the future of vaccines, improving the process, not just from preclinical, but all the way through manufacturing in ways that we will improve the vaccine process and um, really speed it up and make it less expensive. So the last thing I will say that, that we need to work on as a community is vaccine hesitancy. That is something it's not new to measles or SARS-CoV-2. This first cartoon is actually from uh, the time of Jenner when he was making smallpox vaccines. There were groups of people that did not want the smallpox vaccine. And the second flyer, the Anti-Vaccination League of America, is from 1916. So you can see that vaccine hesitancy has been with us as long as vaccines have been available. And that's something that we as a community need to start working together and working with the people that have concerns about vaccines to overcome their concerns. And with that, I will turn it back to Dr. Patel. Thank you, Dr. Schultz, Cherry, and Dr. Dupre. Before we move to the question and answer portion of our program, I want to acknowledge on behalf of ASM, the emergency multi-year funding Congress has appropriated in recent weeks to the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases and the Biomedical Advanced Research and Development Authority to accelerate vaccine development. Without this support, scientists like Dr. Dupre and Dr. Schultz-Cherry would not be able to advance the work towards a safe and effective vaccine. The American Society for Microbiology will continue to be actively engaged with Congress and the administration to advocate for funding and policy provisions, underscoring the need for coordination and funding to ensure su sufficient production, distribution, and delivery of this preventative measure. We're grateful for the congressional attention to these important issues, but it will take all of us as a community working together to inform the public and encourage uptake of a future SARS-CoV-2 vaccine. Thank you so much, Dr. Dupre, Dr. Schultz-Cherry, and Dr. Patel. So now we are going to move into our Q&A portion of our program. And I think um, one of we're going to start off with a question that has been on many minds, and we received an, a number of requests for this uh, in preparation for today's program. So to both uh, Dr. Dupre and Dr. Schultz-Cherry, you know, we are all anxiously awaiting the day when a vaccine is approved and available to the public for SARS-CoV-2. When do you think we'll have a vaccine available? And what are some of the factors that will determine how long it takes to get one to market? Well, I think uh, if you're aware of the news, um, the television, you watch the television at all, you will have heard the numbers 12 to 18 months mentioned again and again. Uh, and that is very, very short. Whenever you see the time frame that Stacy uh, has presented in terms of the standard development of a vaccine, and again, I think it's really important for people to understand that vaccines are not fast. Uh, but what I presented and what Stacey uh, brought you through is a rapid way to accelerate the process. It's very important and, and oftentimes Dr. Fauci has used the 12 to 18 months. Uh, that is an aspiration. Of course, we could do it a little bit quicker, but it may take a little bit longer. And there are many bumps along the way that can uh, be there to surprise us. One of the things which is absolutely critical, and again, this has been mentioned in our presentations, safety is vital. We cannot compromise safety. And I would agree with Dr. Dupree. So everyone can the key is safety. sense the we tension that there is faster, when we want a vaccine. And if it's not safe, the vaccines take time. 
I do think, we however, that we will make the vaccine. But we also want to be realistic. Uh, and more quickly we want than we've seen in the past. Everybody has to remember to that this is a brand new virus. We develop this new virus. If this was a new strain of flu, it would be much easier to make a vaccine more quickly because we have the pipeline in place. It will take a little bit longer for something that is new. But I think we're all very hopeful that this vaccine will come in the near future. Thank you. Um, as we are learning more about our immune system's response to COVID-19, um, and as we're looking at the different types of vaccines and development, how um, is this something that may be needed to be administered annually, like the flu vaccine, or is this something that uh, may confer uh, immunity for a longer period of time? What are what are your thoughts on that and the potential durability of these um, vaccines? That's a great question. That's something we all um, want to know. It's difficult to predict at this time. I think through a number of studies uh, that are monitoring people that are actually infected or have been infected with SARS-CoV-2 and monitoring how long do they have protective immune responses will be very important to telling us uh, and really informing us how often we may need to vaccinate people. But I think at this time, it's very difficult to predict. So um, turning a bit now to questions around clinical trials, with the number of COVID vaccines under development, yeah, um, can you talk a little bit about um, the challenges of finding enough patients to support robust clinical trials and, and sort of what that process looks like and um, what you're, you're seeing? It's not going to be as difficult to recruit people or participants for clinical trials for this particular virus. We don't have to worry about people having underlying immunity, having seen SARS-CoV-2 in the past. Um, and there's a lot of interest in developing a safe and effective vaccine. Where do you find people? They're typically, they um, are announced. There are clinical trial sites people can go to if they're interested in participating. You will see information through social media, through regular flyers. It's very well advertised when companies are ready to start clinical trials. Yeah, I think that people will be very enthusiastic um, about uh, participating in the clinical trial. I just uh, speak personally from Pittsburgh. Uh, we have a Pitt and Me website, and there are, uh, this is not just for vaccines, but this is for clinical trials in general. There are 200, nearly 250,000 people on that list already. Um, website. Um, so we, we know that the SARS-CoV-2 virus is likely um, mutating. Um, and wondering how do potential mutations in the virus um, affect a vaccine, both at this stage, but also going forward? Companies then can work to get the products tested in phase one, two, and three. Well, this is an RNA virus, and both Dr. Cherry and I are RNA virologists, so we know that. RNA viruses mutate all the time. They can mutate in different ways, in slow ways, like SARS coronavirus 2. Um, and they can mutate in really quick, quick ways, like influenza, because influenza can shuffle its genome, genetic material, like a pack of cards, whereas the SARS coronavirus 2, because it's a single strand of nucleic acid, doesn't have that ability to rapidly change. The other thing about SARS coronavirus 2 is it's a coronavirus, and what we know, coronaviruses have proofreading. They have the ability to check the genetic material as it's synthesized. So because of that, they're, they're rather different to other RNA viruses. They don't have this uh, uh, high, high, high level of mutation that you I, see. I think other, it's important to remember so all that, of that would let because us even though a, a virus is changing, it doesn't mean that it's going to affect 
practice that the vaccine that will generate the spike, it's going will to the change, spike will be the spike. Um, the but again, remember that's work in progress. We have to understand how that pathogen evolves as it's selected. We can change the ability uh, of the antibodies that you've built to protect you from that virus. These RNA viruses, they change all the time, like I change my clothes. It doesn't mean that it's changing um, anything fundamental about that virus. So I think that's important as we do see more and more reports about the viruses mutating. You just need to keep that in Great. mind. Great. Uh, another question, um, and I think this is probably more for you, Dr. Dupre. Um, the vaccines that you talked about, the various ones that are in production, um, are there some that are further along in development than others? So significantly that the vaccine was developed all those many, many years ago is still efficient. Yeah. There are some which are a little bit further along. There are some which are a little bit further um, behind. But realistically, given the, the time that we have known about the virus. Um, um, and this is one that's more for uh, Dr. Schultz Cherry. Um, one of the things that I know ASM and, and many others in the community have been so concerned about is reports that childhood preventive immunizations have plummeted uh, during this time of quarantine. Um, we're always concerned about the number of people who are, are willing to get a flu shot in any given year. So um, could you talk more about why, um, as we head into uh, the next flu season in particular, um, that it's going to be so important um, for us as a as a country, the population to continue our routine immunizations um, and also the seasonal ones such as flu while we are waiting um, for a SARS vaccine. Absolutely. You know, all the focus right now, and for obvious reasons, is on SARS CoV 2. That does not mean that there aren't still our common viruses circulating. You absolutely should be getting your children vaccinated with their. Um, their typical childhood vaccines. Measles is still out there. Mumps is still out there. Honestly, we don't know what is going to happen if SARS-CoV-2 is still circulating when the flu season starts in the fall. It's something that there are um, groups of us actually looking at. We're watching the Southern Hemisphere. They're now moving into their influenza season. We're watching uh, tropical regions really on the equator that get flu uh, year-round. You'd like to understand, are they going to co-circulate? Are they going to co-infect people? We just don't know, and that's why you really want to get your flu shot, because we don't know if there's a possibility of these things co-infecting. Um, how can policymakers um, and those of us um, working in this space, how can we you know, best communicate the importance of these preventive measure, measures, um, whether it's a policymaker communicating it to their constituents um, or organizations and then others communicating with the public. Um, what are some of the ways that we can do that? And, and just what are your thoughts on the education piece? I think that uh, what's happening here is a perfect example where policymakers are hearing science Science, science, science. It starts with the data. And we are governed by doing experiments, performing those, repeating them, checking, and ensuring that the data is what drives our decisions. So I just am very impressed that our colleagues uh, on this call are, are so willing to listen to the science behind the vaccines. And that's a great start because oftentimes in, in life, we treat all of the data, all of the information we get as equal. But of course, the American Society for Microbiology, years and years and years of experience Thousands of individuals who are microbiologists, who do microbiology consistently, carefully, 
doing the basic science which drives the development of these interventions. Because if we don't have that basic science, we don't have a virologist, we don't have bacteriologists and parasitologists, we don't have those people who are ready to respond quickly, who are ready to, to partner with policymakers, because we're in this together. We might be virologists, but we're also part of a community. And we want a vaccine as much as those policymakers do, and we want a good vaccine. If I may, so it's a partnership. I think and that's where the national society um, Dr. and Dr. Sherry, I think that this world, pandemic, as so awful super as it is, it is really emphasizes what a vaccine can potentially do. I mean, there was the no way we would be sitting poised, ready with a vaccine a on day one. But imagine if we story. had been somehow, right? Imagine what we can do in the future if we do things better and what we can learn. Um, you know, this has completely disrupted pretty much everyone across the globe. Um, and normally, I would say that we microbiologists, we spend most of our time talking to other microbiologists, which is why we know each other very well. Now everyone's interested in what we're doing. Uh, this really emphasizes the importance of what we're doing. It emphasizes the importance of vaccination. As Dr. Schultz-Cherry mentioned, we have routine vaccinations that have made a huge difference in the world. We do need to make sure they get given in the face of this pandemic uh, so that we don't slip back on all the progress that we've made. But I think it's really a time to recognize the importance of science, as Dr. Dupre mentioned, and what science can do to get us out of this big mess that we found ourselves in. Yeah, I, I agree with both. Robin and Paul. I, mean, I think the other thing we need to remind people is that, you know, when you get vaccinated, you're not just protecting yourself, you're protecting other people. And this is really important when there are um, members of the community, like look at the kids at St. Jude, um, other people oh, with cancer. There are people that can't get vaccinated. It's our responsibility as community members to make sure that we're protecting those most vulnerable people by being vaccinated ourselves. You know, if you choose not to get the vaccine, especially with something like SARS when you're a healthy adult, you may be fine. But when you go visit grandma, when you go visit your friend's new baby, they may not be fine if you're carrying your disease. Great. Well, yeah, and if you just think about the if you just one one final comment, the, the one thing that we didn't mention was preparedness. Um, you know, we had SARS one, and we never brought a vaccine to completion because it went away and it was a problem. That's the coronavirus. We have MERS, but it's restricted to the Middle East. That's a coronavirus, and we don't have a vaccine. And if we had a thought that preparedness mattered, and if we realized and recognized that viruses do Well, our time is just about finished, and I, I really can't think of a better way to end than um, this last question and the, the discussion that we, that we just had. So um, in closing, I want to thank you again. Um, I want to thank our distinguished speakers, Dr. Dupre, Dr. Schultz-Cherry, Dr. Robin Patel for her leadership. And I want to thank all of you for joining us this afternoon. <laughs>